Up next, we have a panel discussion on exploring the future of machine learning and AI. So I am going to bring in our two additional speakers. If three. You want. three. We have three. three. Yes, we have Dr. Middlefart. We have Matt Dupree. And we have the amazing Tiffany Jackia. So I am so happy that everyone is here. Um, wait, I just saw Matt. There's Matt. What happened? Matt. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Matt, we're coming. There we go. Awesome. Okay, so Josh, you have some company now. Um, and if you're ready, we will go behind the scenes. Well, there you go. You the person. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It's great to all be together again. Um, I think we'll start very, very quickly, given that everyone's. Hold on, like... we're going to come back on quickly. I cut Lisa off, but somebody's echoing. Someone needs to mute something. Uh, okay, there's no. Is there echoing now? Yes. Technical difficulties. Still might, have. Might be you, Morton. Is it me? I think uh, it might be. Because everybody else is muted. Oh, okay. I can mute. Is that what you want? And then come back and on. Okay. We, we think we're good. All right. We're ducking out again. Okay. There we go. Can everyone hear? Fantastic. So um, thank you all very much for joining me today, today on the panel. It's great to actually have some reoccurring members on it today. Um, let's start with a little bit of a round of introductions. Uh, Morton, if you'd like to go first, Matt second, and then Tiffany third. A little bit about your involvement in machine learning and artificial intelligence and what you do day to day. Yeah. Hey, I'm uh, Morten Middelfart. Uh, I've been uh, working with data analytics and involved in, uh, in the business side of things since the early 90s. I've specifically been involved in uh, data mining and artificial intelligence since the mid 90s. Uh, most recently, I've uh, co-founded uh, the company called Lumina Analytics here in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and that is going on eight years now. Um, I primarily work with uh, medical imaging for breast cancer detection uh, at the moment, but we also do hedge funds and also uh, various types of security and analytics, physical security, typically. Cool. Um, I'm Matt. I, uh, I uh, most recently was at Heat Analytics, uh, the product analytics company. I was working there on the data science team. Uh, so I was doing some machine learning and work with data there. And uh, I left that real job uh, in the middle of last year to start my own thing, working on a data notebook tool for data scientists. So that's me. Nice. Hi, everyone. My name is Tiffany Jakja. I started off my machine learning data science career by graduating um, and doing my graduate degree in it. Um, and then I ended up leading data products at Vox Media, where we were building um, data products using machine learning for revenue and commerce products. And now I lead a team as an engineering manager at Autodesk, and I'm supporting platform services there. Fantastic. And I think it's really good to see just a breadth of different ML use cases across different industries there. I think we'll have some really interesting discussions actually on how these could all be used slightly differently depending on what problem we're solving. Um, I'll start off the discussion hot off the press, I believe came to the news yesterday, um, that Elon Musk, Andrew Yang and Steve Wozniak all came together to talk about a great AI pause for the next six months for any model larger than GPT-4. I view that as more than 170 trillion parameters, um, which I think is quite a large scale of machine learning. Uh, this has obviously come at a very shocking point where I think things like chat GPT and GPT-4 have picked up a lot of steam. It'd be good to have a discussion around that recent news. Um, it'd be good to start with you, Matt. What, what's your take on that? How does that make you feel as an AI professional? Yeah, okay, so one thing I want to call out really quickly, we we just had Steve Wozniak at Sevo Navigate a couple months ago, and he was kind of poo-pooing on the state of AI, so it's kind of a shocking reversal um, to have him sign that that open letter for a moratorium on, on um, kind of models more, um, more powerful than GPT-4, and I think it does speak to um, how impressive these models are. Uh, so there, you know, there's something to be said about that. 
At the same time, uh, and and I haven't, my mind isn't made up about this. Okay, it's 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 complicated. You know, like you said, it's hot off the press. There's a part of me that wonders if uh, asking for this sort of moratorium gives um, these models more credit than they deserve. Uh, so uh, to to make that really concrete, um, I I was working with another founder recently who was like, yeah, I'm really trying to find like a good virtual assistant, and the problem is they keep all trying to give the work to ChatGPT and sending it to me, and it's bad. And so that's like that's like a that's like a really concrete thing where it's like even in the case of virtual assistants, these large language models are not really getting the job done. Uh, so that's not really answering your question. It's just kind of providing like two data points or two kind of contrasting viewpoints. But I'll I'll leave it there for now if that makes sense. So I think that's actually really interesting, um, and I think it all comes down to use case and scale. It'd be interesting. Um, Morton, do you see any of that coming across quite strongly in the kind of medical and science space? Well, I, I see uh, that whole discussion uh, in two different ways. First of all, I completely agree that um, the AI is no better than the data for, on which it's trained. Um, and uh, I think that ties into what, what Matt said, that it's really the use case that it comes down to. Um, I cannot help but think there's also another uh, aspect that uh, is very close to my heart, which is the idea of whether we're truly working on the right type of AI and the right type of models. I'm a uh, great believer in making models uh, much more available to everybody, meaning that the, uh, the fact that we're talking about limiting something uh, of a system that costs uh, billions to build or millions probably now is is uh, yes we can we can talk about that but I'm much more interested in how could we bring uh, AI to work for everybody and not just for a huge corporation and in fact that's uh, where I came from back in the 90s when we did that with business analytics and to me it feels a little bit the same. Back in the day, nobody could have a what we call it a data warehouse or huge database, uh, and and the insurance company used it widely to probably discriminate then, as you know, or you know, I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm simply saying you could you could view that situation somewhat similar that it's something that's not for everybody and it's being used against everybody, and nobody really have any understanding and oversight. So I think to break that barrier, it's all about kind of like actually going much smaller, but more wide in terms of use cases. Um, so that's the first thing. And then secondly, also tying into math, I find it interesting that we're building systems that are, uh, they're first of all, not transparent, but in addition, they're lying. It's, it's simply making stuff up. And that is a known fact about how the technology is built. So if one thinks about systems that are driven within confused states and borderlining lying at least half of the time or something, is that really the type of systems we want to kind of like running our future on? Wouldn't we want something that has to do with truth, democratization and transparency? So, so I think that's a much more interesting discussion than saying, should we pause the big ones? Because I don't think they're going to stop. Anyway, <laughs> that's just my take. That's still really interesting. I think some of the points there actually around the integrity, around the return results is really important for us to consider. Um, Tiffany, I've got to know what you think about this from an enterprise perspective. Um, where do you see this leading to, particularly with this being very AI research focused? Yeah, I 100% think it's an anti-competition thing between large corporations that are trying to find the best ways to make money off of AI and ML now, especially coming off of the hype with ChatGPT and then more folks like understanding what the technology is. You have, you know, content, podcasts, interviews with top AI scientists and researchers are contributing to the field, right? And it's becoming more and more accessible. But now this is just another form of gatekeeping, to be honest. That's how I see it, especially because like at the end of the day, like it's true, these aren't all, all there is to AI and ML, like these very large models that we're training. That's not all that there is. And there's 
I, I don't think it's too bad that they've um, kind of locked this down because it gives us a chance to, like um, doctor said, like look at the underlying data, right? Like see and investigate what kinds of um, models are out there that don't require training billions of parameters, you know, things like few shot learning models as well, like trying to investigate like, okay, what are some some other ways that we can innovate around this area? So, you know, it's, I think it's a large tech giants kind of world right now, especially with like, you know, the leading data scientists kind of deciding this uh, for the community. But at the end of the day, I think that there's still a lot of opportunities for us to kind of innovate in this area. It's still a fresh new area, as long as it's been around. I think that, you know, we're really just, we're just really starting out right now. Like we're just now getting to like have deep learning models, these large NLP models become usable in some way. So we're still, we're still cutting the, we're just, we're still at the tip of the iceberg. I think that's actually really interesting. And just to summarize, I think for the audience, I think there's some really good questions there around the accuracy of these models and how confidently they're presenting the responses. I think Matt had a really interesting point there actually is some of these models getting more credit than they deserve and actually is some of the marketing rolling faster than the technology here. Um, yeah, I, can I jump in on that? I think there's like a, so I like Tiffany's kind of like anti-competitive like lens to, to view this kind of letter. Another, like another way to look at it is, and this is maybe paranoid or cynical, is it's like, it's actually a really brilliant marketing play by like the large language model people because they're like, this is so powerful, we should be scared. Like, it's like, well, that's great. Like, that's really good marketing, right? So there's there is there is there's a possibility that that could be what's going on here. Um, but I mean, we, you know, we're all just speculating here, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, I just wanted to tag along on that. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Having been in quite a lot of large model training processes myself, I did some math on how big larger than GPT-4 would be. And if you're looking at training like a hundred trillion parameter model using, yeah, if you're looking at training about a hundred trillion parameter model, you're probably looking at about 10,000 GPUs and you're probably running them for a while. Is the big may, um, may I intervene here? That is oh. assuming that a neural network is the right answer. And I actually disagree with that. So I think we've, we're talking about, like, since I said, confusing models that lie. Now maybe it's the time to rethink that paradigm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. There's, like, there's a couple of, um, couple of AI researchers that are saying that LLMs are like an off-ramp to general artificial intelligence. Like, we're not going to get there by just throwing more data and larger, larger models at it. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm not, I, <laughs> things are changing so fast that like my, my perspective on this kind of shifts as, as we see things, um, kind of develop, but you know, I'm sympathetic to, to the view, like Gary Marcus is a good example, right? That uh, he actually had an article in the New York times recently, an interview with Ezra Klein on, on how like the, just the deep learning approach may not even be, we might be barking up the wrong tree. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think it's worth giving voice to that kind of perspective and, um, I think actually there was a comment in the uh, in the chat here about diminishing returns with these models. Um, so it's it's very possible, like if these uh, that the off ramp folks are right, that when they train GTP, GPT five, let's assume that it doesn't get killed, and they train GPT five, it's very possible that the results are underwhelming. That we're just like, nah, okay, yeah, it's like still making up stuff, and like the like, uh, I mean that wouldn't that wouldn't be terribly surprising if if that's what happened. I think that's fascinating as well. Like one of the challenges we have with NLP problems, right, is you can only get to a certain degree of accuracy where actually a human doesn't become a reliable validator. Like we as humans make mistakes on understanding of, understandings of what other humans say every day. I think we have to build an expectation here that these models have a similar degree of error, that they are fallible in the same way that the human annotators command them to be. I think this is also a really good time for us to start looking at the um, delimitation of what's regarded as machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence. Um, deep learning is a concept invented in 1960s, 1970s. And I think actually we're using AI as the types of terms to refer to large scale deep learning, when actually that's leading into stuff like OpenAI recently talking about sparks of generalized intelligence. 
I think that actually these these barriers are becoming grayer and grayer as we progress. Well, I think that's marketing. I think I don't think we've seen a spark of general AI whatsoever. And but you know, we've seen a spark that we could mistake for. Well, what it, what I mean, maybe it's useful to define like general intelligence, you know, because there's like I, I I'm sympathetic to your perspective, but then like I've seen these snarky tweets that are like, oh, weird, people think ChatGPT is smart, like it passed the bar and like the, all of these AP tests and the GRE, like that feels pretty general, right? So like what maybe it's helpful to nail down what we mean by general intelligence. I think um, one of the definitions I really like from Steve Wozniak, he's obviously very in vogue with this subject, is he has the equivalent of a Turing test where he says an artificial intelligence has to go to an average American household, knock on the door, walk in, find the coffee machine, find a mug, make a cup of coffee, and then serve it. And I think until ChatGPT is doing that for me, I'm probably not going to regard it as generally intelligent. Tiffany, what do you think? Yeah, I think um, I think it's it's still being defined. Um, I think for a lot of people too, like the boundaries aren't well known. And then as everybody kind of comes in and has their own definitions of it, it becomes more confusing. So I think it's always really helpful to leverage or go back to um, you know historical periods of time where these terms were being coined and what was meant during that time and how have we evolved since then because uh, I, I do think that there is a lot of buzzwords that are flying around. I think a lot of people are capitalizing on this time in particular to really coin new terms, coin new ideas as well, and like push their own agendas for whatever it is that they're building. Um, it's great and all, um, but you know, for the average person, like for the average engineering manager, the average enterprise worker, you're really just trying to figure out like, how do you make this usable or practical um, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And and so, you know, there's a lot of co controversy and co conversations around this topic, but um, I think from a practical standpoint or from a standpoint of like being able to actually use this in a day-to-day -day basis, we kind of have to digest the terms and kind of understand this and have our own definitions going into it. Um, and if you don't have that, it just becomes this um, this tidal wave of information, right? I think that's a really good way to phrase it, actually. Let's um, try and fit in another question before we turn it around to the audience. I can see plenty in the chat. Um, so I think one of the interesting stats has come out alongside this uh, generalized intelligence, but then also chat GPT hype is McKinsey and Quantum Black have recently estimated that they predict 50% of all the tasks you do at work are ready to be automated. That's been a heavily debated viewpoint. I think what would be a really good discussion to ask you guys with the breadth of experience you have is what do you think will be the first roles that would be automated and which ones do you think will be the very last? Open floor for everyone to take that. I think um, the task that is really uh, available for practical AI application is uh, extension of human ability. Meaning, for example, the doctor being able to do the diagnosis, but but do it faster, do it more reliably, but in tandem with the machinery. Uh, so I don't think we're talking about, oh, AI is taking over, these guys are gonna go away. It is gonna be an augmentation of the job and, uh, and a, a um, let's say valuable partner uh, for the human uh, aspect, in my opinion. So you, just to be clear, you kind of reject the the McK like the McKinseyan thesis. Yeah, I, I think kind of it's I think it's inflated because think about it. If we think that these uh, models are just going to take over uh, human jobs uh, like completely, right? Um, let's look at what happened with self-driving cars. Um, you know, we've been saying there, oh, it's one year away, but we've been saying that for how many years? Uh, I I lost count, right? And I don't think we're having them next year either. So there is just a problem with the fact that a model is trained on data and reality, uh, you know, for example, walking into a random house and brewing coffee, uh, you know, is, is different. 
you cannot train for the uh, like the human brain is fundamentally different from how these systems are built. And I think it's it's important that we just pragmatically understand that and then apply it in the best way possible to the use case. Um, so so uh, and I think that's kind of like that's also why I talk about the uh, type of democratization where we should make AI our body for whatever problem we have, as opposed to just say somebody build a general something and then we should just all use that for any task given. I think it works the other way around. I think disruption always comes from below and growing upwards uh, in the masses uh, rather than it comes top down. That's another uh, just technology fact. Um, yeah, I'll pause there. <laughs> Yeah, I'll add to that. I think that's a really um, succinct summary of what's happening in uh, even like the cloud native platform engineering space. You see a lot more uh, machine learning and AI being integrated into platforms like um, APMs, right? Like different ways to get uh, distributed tracing, monitoring into large systems through AI and ML, um, even things like um, AI and ML auto-generated code, right? Um, things like tests, unit tests, getting automated generate, automate, automatically generated um, unit tests, things like that. I mean, they still require the actual developers to be in the seats programming, thinking about design um, requirements and constraints, right? Um, and we are using a lot of those tools to augment that process. And then we're building software, we're then building software faster and better across, um, you know, hundreds of teams, thousands of uh, developers at a time. So I think that kind of speaks to a lot of it and how we're seeing it. I think that also means that there is like the surge or this interest and, and specialization around being able to build platforms as a service. Um, and, and we've seen that for quite some time now over the last 10 years, right? Just the surge of um, titles like platform engineer, DevOps engineer, right? Um, kind of blending in a bunch of different kinds of software engineering expertise, right? Into the mix and, and giving people an opportunity to kind of continue to build additional levels of abstraction and, and tooling to be able to do, it, do what it is that they need to do. That's such a really yeah. interesting point. Sorry, Matt, off to you. Yeah, I, I was just thinking more about kind of a, the question of, all right, so I, it seems like we're roughly in agreement that the McKinsey number is kind of inflated, right? But if we think about the, just the future and like the possibility of jobs being replaced by AI, I think there's, there's kind of, there's three axes that are relevant. One is um, like how accurate the AI has to be. Uh, the other is the number of modalities involved in the job that's being replaced. So like, for example, like copywriting, the modality is text. Um, and so like, and we're in a pretty good spot uh, to, to, to start replacing. Well, I don't want to say replacing, but for AI to make a contribution. And um, then the third thing is um, just the number of disparate data sources that need to be uh, kind of worked with. And that could be within one modality or within multiple modalities. But as the number of modalities goes up, the number of data sources goes up, and the number uh, or the the accuracy required goes up, that the, the jobs that are kind of high on those dimensions are the ones that are going to be last to be replaced by AI, and the the ones that are low on those dimensions are are ones that are um, susceptible to being replaced or at least uh, helped or contributed to by AI. So I can we can talk about like copywriting, for example. Um, or actually copywriting is, I don't even think particularly ready to be replaced by AI. Uh, I, but I do think maybe something like creative writing, if you think about the axes there, the modality is text. There's only a single modality. There are no data sources that you're required to integrate with. And accuracy doesn't matter. It's literally creative, like it's creative, like you're just creating a story. So that's something that I could see that's feasible, like that the AI could like replace creative writers. Um, maybe not outright like but they could really make a serious contribution there uh and it when we move to something like copywriting like okay we're still within the modality of text but there's something accuracy really matters you can't just be putting out like wrong information and then there's also this 
this doesn't fit into the framework I articulated, I specified, but anyway, that's my take on some of those. Yeah, and I, if I may just add, because I, I like the framework you, you created there, uh, except the only thing that I strongly feel about as well is what the human thinking machine is, as opposed to a computer, is bigger in the sense of uh, ability to, uh, let's say, uh, access creative thought and access, in, in my opinion, actually, much more information that we truly comprehend that we access. Um, and computers cannot do that. So, so what is creativity then? Is creativity just doing something that we can uh, do a test and say, was it written before or not? Or is creativity something that touches the heart of another human being? If it's the latter, then I think, uh, you know, creative writing is not really short term replaceable either. Uh, I do agree that everybody's job will probably get easier, but that just means that we get more uh, time to allow ourselves to be human, to be more expansively creative. And I don't see that as a bad thing. Um, you know, trivial stuff, of course, uh, will be uh, to some extent automated, uh, but that's also trivial stuff. So we should really be using ourselves better anyway, in my opinion. I think it's a good thing. I've got to, I've got to bring this back up for the audience. So I think um, to round up the very depthy discussion there, I think we had a lot of conversation around Hotspots for AI seem to be augmentations of human ability, not necessarily replacing the ability. We all think that the 50% number from McKinsey may be something to do with the fact that they sell automation systems for a living. Um, we see a really strong trait about artificial intelligence taking the same pathway as we think software engineering did, which was a very grassroots approach. And actually, top-down mentality and technology doesn't really seem to ever bring consumer consensus um, I think there's some really interesting points, actually, that Tiffany, Matt and Morton all brought up that are quite philosophical, such as these jobs to automate jobs are becoming jobs. I think that there's a question here around the philosophical question of what good looks like from the output of an artificial intelligence. Um, and I think, actually, there's some really deep points there from you, Morton, around what's creativity and actually is artificial intelligence's job to give us more time to be intrinsically human and do the computationally expensive job within the world, which is be creative, that a machine learning model can't. I'm going to um, dive into some qu questions around augmentation, I think, before we turn it towards questions on the panel. Um, so we've recently seen something like GitHub Copilot be a really powerful machine augmentation tool for software engineers. It massively transforms the way they work. It probably helps them build more complex systems and probably helps them think less from an understanding point of view. What's the next job that's going to have a GitHub Copilot? Are we going to get a gardener start to use augmented reality? Good discussion from each of your perspectives. Uh, yeah, I can I can jump in here. Uh, I do want to say something really quickly about GitHub Copilot because I am I'm using it and and you know and write a fair amount of code. Um, I, I, I yeah, there's something that I think people are not talking about quite enough, and I guess it ties into the hallucination piece. But one thing that I found using ChatGPT and Copilot for writing code is I actually find myself in a similar situation when I'm searching on Stack Overflow. So I, I like I get some code and I'm looking at it on Stack Overflow. It's a source for you know getting code for programmers, right? Everybody I think knows that here. And then I'm like, okay, is this code actually right? Uh, and so I, I like when I ask that question enough, I actually wind up not using Stack Overflow that much. I just go straight to the documentation because like even though there's this really nice kind of curated human curated piece of code that I can use, I'm just like, but is it outdated? Like, is it? And I actually did have this exact experience with. Um, some like AWS S3 code that I was getting ChatGPT to write, it turned out that the code was for an earlier version of the SDK and there was a different way of doing it. And so it felt like I was just going to Stack Overflow, but instead of having a human, human curate the code, it was a very expensive model that like did it. Um, so so that, that's just a quick comment on, I guess, the limitations of co-piloting. 
Um, I do think, so one thing I actually, um, <laughs> so I, in my intro, I mentioned that I'm working on a tool for data scientists. I'm in the middle of a pivot. Uh, this is like hot, hot off the press, y'all. Uh, but I'm actually thinking about a co-pilot for using software products. Uh, so the idea here is you, let's say you're using Salesforce. Salesforce is beast. It's pretty complicated. Um, you don't know how to do something within Salesforce. You type in what you want to do and you get the guidance within Salesforce to do it. Like, I think that that stuff like that, that's like a, like a very imminent, uh, type of co-pilot, like a product co-pilot. That's what I'm, that's what I've actually started working on. And I think things in that genre are things that are next. And if we think about that framework that I gave about disparate data sources, modalities, and accuracy, um, a product copilot, if the human's in the loop, the accuracy doesn't have to be particularly high. Uh, the modality that it's dealing with is, is software. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's things largely text and in some cases images. And then the data sources is just the single data source of the product itself. And so it fits into something where AI can have a contribution. I absolutely agree, Matt. I, I think what, what um, uh, first of all, great and good idea. I, I, I truly believe that could work. And actually, for all the reasons you said, it's simpler uh, problem because you're already within a, a software product. Uh, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with making everything easy. Uh, which, uh, whether that be coding or whether that be using software, uh, a, a specific product, because that, that itself can be complicated enough, but not as complicated as coding, I believe. Um, so I think we'll just see a lot of more like branching out, actually, in terms of abilities for more people than before to be able to do more cool stuff. And again, that's boosting human creativity in the aggregate. I think we'll see something along the lines of what happened to server systems before, uh, you know, and, and back in the 80s and 90s, we had like very complicated server systems just for a file server. Then came Windows, made it easier to navigate your spreadsheets and your word processing on the desktop. Later, the Windows servers made it easy to run a file server and beyond. And, um, you know, here we are. So I think we'll see similar uh, trickling into different walks of uh, usability and ease and simplicity. Uh, and that's going to drive the applications from a just a pragmatic, what problem do you have type of approach would, would be my expectation of, of where, where we're going to see the next. And I look forward to see what's going to happen with what you do, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, me too. Yeah, what an exciting space to be in, like just even seeing it trickle into things like commerce and the medical field, right? Like there's so many different applications and we'll continue to see those um, those applications. I think it's great that someone also pointed out plugins in chat, um, how you can literally just, you know, even use systems that are already out there, models are already trained and then leverage that in a real time manner. I think those are really great use cases. And then I'll, obviously as well, like these different um, software companies that have platforms or even um, there are many, we, this is, you know, we talked about open source. There are a lot of open source platforms as well, like being able to augment those with different features and modules to extend those platforms, I think is really helpful. I will say like, um, the reason why we harp on this panel, the reason why we harped a lot on data is because there is a lot of information in that data, right? Like if there's garbage data in our um, models, we're not gonna get good data out. Um, and I, I think this also goes back to the concept of like tribal knowledge and like what we know as humans, a lot of it doesn't get transferred into the training sets and the data sets that we're using to train our models. So while there's like really great succinct answers to very specific types of questions, um, the model isn't necessarily learning all of the context that we have in the space. And I think we'll, we'll begin to kind of understand what the limitations are around that. And I think that will be really helpful because um, I, I don't think a lot of people are talking about that right now is like, okay, all these big companies are finding ways to curate these very 
um, diverse data sets, but like in terms of the actual content of the data itself, how diverse is that, you know, and how much context are we getting or tribal knowledge are we getting from those sources? Um, things like that. I think there's going to be more science around how we collect data and that'll hopefully be great because that's been a space that we've been wanting to see expand for a long time. I think really good response there. And I think, um, Good to see that across the different industries we brought together today, we can actually see some commonality behind some of these AI trends. But I think still really interesting to see the different ways we're all leveraging them. Um, I'm going to ask all the panelists after this to just jump into the comments and start to respond to people's questions. I think that'll be a really interesting conversation there. But thank you all so much for coming on today and giving us an overview of each of your domains. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting chat. And as we said, there's been a bunch of comments. So please stay, read them if you have more questions for everyone. Thank you. Yes, the chat was, that might have been the most active chat. It was really used as a chat. There was other discussions that were happening in the chat. So you'll be interested in all those, I'm sure. And then I know, Tiffany, you were showing up as Matt in the chat. So maybe bracket, if that's still the case, just bracket your answers with your name or your initials so that we know it's you. But thank you so much, for everybody, for agreeing to be part of our show and for being on that very important, very interesting panel.